Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who is listening from all over the world. I'm very happy right now that we are back again streaming from where I am right now from Malaysia. And today I have a very interesting topic, it's about truthfulness. If you read the news, if you are very active in social media, perhaps you might realize that truthfulness may seem to be on the decline. If you keep track of the daily lies that are discovered in politics, in recruitment, when CVs are enhanced with a little bit of lies or a lot of lies, and then in social media, in schools, from my experience, really some students can get used to um, some lies, some of them, no? So reasons are really aplenty for why people don't speak the truth. And these are good starting points to understand the reasons why they are doing that. And that's very good to understand so that we can move forward in order to come up with strategies to have more truthfulness around us or inside of us. And Germany's Holocaust education is a powerful case study for courageously counteracting denial and distortion of the truth. And our guest, German Embassy Head of Mission, Laura Oexle, will talk about the beginnings and the learnings from the Holocaust education. As a parent, she will also share her strategies and her tips to educating her children in truthfulness. Hi, Laura. Hi, hello. Just also a little bit of context because in June, my friends and I, they agreed to sit with me to watch Judgment at Nuremberg. So it has been um, in my wish list of films to watch for ethics for when I teach ethics. So it's been in my wish list, never really had the time to watch the film, although I've read so much about it. And I was very curious about how Germany is tackling those years of the Holocaust, how they're facing it. And some German visitors told a friend of mine who also watched the film with me, they said that actually they have a Holocaust education. I got really interested in that, and I think we will learn a lot from Germany's experience. So, Laura, could you please describe to us the Holocaust education in Germany? Yes, of course. I mean, before we start describing the Holocaust education, we have to be at the same page what this is really about. So, it's about of course, understanding what happened in Germany in this period between 1933 and 1945, to understand how Hitler came into power, how could that happen, um, but then also naming the perpetrators and um, most importantly, naming the victims to understand what happened to them, who were the victims. And um, I mean, we know that it was mainly targeted uh, at the Jewish population in Europe, but there were also Sinti and Roma peoples, there were sla Slavs, um, there were uh, homosexuals targeted and uh, political enemies. They were marginalized, they were imprisoned, and eventually they were killed. And there were six million um, uh, Jews in Europe, around two thirds of the Jewish population in Europe um, victims and killed in a genocide and this became known as the Holocaust and um, so this is what what Holocaust education is first about to really equip students and, and children with um, this knowledge and um, so that we are all at the same page but then as there is also something beyond that it's really about historical consciousness and empathy but then it's about uh, empowering our students and empowering them in their development of a democratic attitude and empower them to make the right decisions and to make informed decisions based on their past. And um, I would like to, to mention two studies here to um, just explain how relevant this topic still is or how relevant it is to rethink Holocaust education uh, all the time and to optimize it and improve it. Um, because as you might all know, racism is quite widespread in Europe, but especially also in Germany. And um, I read that one fifth of the German population were themselves or have reported to be victims of racism in Germany. 
And um, half of the German population, about 50 percent, have been have witnessed um, incidents of racism. So, so this is one thing. And then, if we look at education specifically, um, we know from a survey of the Kerber Foundation um, this very shocking number that around 40 percent of the German students, um, but this is the age um, between 14 and 50 and um, 17, didn't know what Auschwitz was about. And I mean, this is really concerning and this really led um, uh, to a new impetus or gave a new impetus in Germany, um, in the German parliament and, and also in German politics to rethink Holocaust education in Germany. And of course, we have a, a long history of Holocaust education. Um, it actually started right away, right after uh, um, the, the world, uh, right after the end of, of World War II. Um, there was some kind of pressure of uh, the Allies to denazify and to re-educate the German population. So we had this impetus from, of course, outside first. And um, of course, in the beginning, there was probably not everywhere an internal motivation to, to deal with uh, the German past, which was so immediate at that time. And then the Cold War uh, happened and there was this divergence because Germany was split in, in the eastern and in the western part. And this is also something interesting actually to, to look at how different um, the two Germanys actually dealt with Holocaust education at that time. So um, the West Germany actually focused on, on the constitutional values and it was really about the credibility of the Federal Republic of Germany as a free and democratic um, state. And um, they, of course, immediately introduced the federal system in, uh, in education. So we are also see um, different developments depending on uh, which area you look at. Um, of course, there were setbacks in, in Western Germany. And then um, I think it was in 1992 when um, Holocaust education um, was really made a requirement, as I said before, that every German uh, student um, will have a Holocaust education in their curriculum. So no student leaves um, the school without having um, dealt with Holocaust in their education. And then just maybe a sentence on, on Eastern Germany. This is already before, of course, 1992. Uh, so the focus was, was a bit different there. It was really focused on anti-fascism. It was focused on uh, the collective rather than the individual. So there was not really a discussion between generations as we saw it in West Germany um, that the, the kids asked their parents and their grandparents about their roles uh, during um, the Nazi regime. But it was more, uh, um, there was no, no confrontation with the um, individual past. Then, as I said, it has been after the reunification um, really, the systems also have been um, uh, unified, and um, I think there's quite an elaborate, uh, um, an elaborate strategy of how holistic and and um, uh, yeah, holistic uh, Holocaust education should take place with unified goals and unified methods, and a stress uh, on memorial sites on. Uh, fitnesses on on uh, museums and archives. Um, yeah, I think this is this is maybe the basics that we uh, should be aware of. Yes, thank you very much. That is really like a summary of all the antecedents of the Holocaust education. So it really is like an alarming situation. It is. I think the the um, strategy really is, and this has been successful, that there is no German student who leaves school without having been educated about the Holocaust. So this is the baseline. And then, of course, we have a federal system in our educational sector. So all the 16 different federal states of Germany, of course, have their own ways of uh, dealing with Holocaust education. But in the end, the baseline is every student uh, learns a lot about Holocaust, starting from grade eight. 
and um, all the way uh, uh, until they um, they leave school. And of course, there are common um, common goals and common um, and a common understanding of what we actually want uh, uh, with our Holocaust education in Germany. As a student, did you? go through that process that there was less of that education and then afterwards when you were in school there were more uh, initiative on that like what did you experience as a student actually for myself i think i enjoyed quite a holistic and quite an extensive uh, holocaust education at school we also started around grade eight uh, and in our history classes, this was really the focus, grade 8, grade 9, grade 10. I think there was hardly anything but um, this topic that was covered in our history classes. And I think it was being dealt with in a very, um, in a very good way. So uh, students actually didn't get bored, but rather got really interested into the topic, asking themselves or we ask ourselves the questions like, how could this happen? Um, what can we do? What can we do in the future to make this um, never happen again? And uh, it was not only in our textbooks and teachers telling us about, um, about Germany's past and about the Holocaust. It was also about going to museums, um, visiting memorials, um, but then also visiting a concentration camp, which was really, really um, impressive, like sadly impressive uh, for all of us. And there we also met with um, contemporary witnesses, people who were survivors of that very concentration camp. In my, in my case, it was a concentration camp in Bavaria in Dachau. And um, these are really memories that I still have very clearly in my mind, even though it's uh, quite a few years ago, that we talked to these persons who um, experienced the worst things you can ever imagine and who are, have the, the courage to go there again and talk to students about what they have experienced. And then, I mean, you started introducing the topic with movies and there are many, many very good educational um, movies about the Holocaust, not only documentaries, but also um, movies that are actually just interesting to watch and also some that are more, um, uh, uh, that are actually good to watch also for, for students at a younger age, not too brutal, but still uh, making students and, um, and even children understand what happened at that time and, and how people and how Jews especially were affected um, by the Nazi regime in Germany. That's good. I actually heard about a particular film since you have mentioned movies. Of course, I watched Schindler's List, um, one other film that I forgot. But recently I noted that there's still that effort to look into all the films and to see how accurate they are. So is there a constant effort to go through all of this um, multimedia, which I think is appealing to the young generation, but still there must be a care to, to know which is accurate. I don't know this specific case, but uh, I can imagine, and it's quite clear that there is this trade-off between artistic freedom, of course, when, when we talk about movies, and of course historic historical accuracy but I think that regarding the Holocaust we really have to be historically accurate and we cannot tolerate content that especially like minimizes uh, um, what happened at that time so I think especially in this case we have to be correct and we have to um, um, you know teach our our kids uh, uh, really about the truth very good. And you mentioned also that you listened to some survivors, to some people who have experienced, and I think really in terms of education, that really can sometimes be, for some students, it can be, be much more memorable than being there in the structures, uh, in the camps, and not seeing anyone who actually experienced it. So that's why in education, storytelling is really, really effective. But my concern right now is by the time your children have reached an age and being there. I don't know how um, would there still be survivors at that age. Somehow I've read that 
there's a concern that the ones who have suffered this probably will be gone. And and what what could be uh, the alternative to listen to these stories to actual people? Yeah, yeah, I think this is exactly the crucial point, and this is really the question that. Uh, educators and also uh, politicians ask themselves because um, we are really at the crossroads now that there are unfortunately less and less uh, um, contemporary witnesses because we talk about the period as I said between 1933 and 1945 and um, I think there are many many uh, good initiatives of how to uh, deal with this of course, natural development. And um, I mean, other countries face it as well with um, like uh, um, historical periods um, that are so far in the past that there are no more um, survivors and no more um, contemporary victims. And I think modern technology really offers a lot of options. I've uh, uh, heard about um, uh, museums which really um, um, collect a lot of video content at the moment, um, really archiving all the details that these witnesses um, can share or can still share, and even to make it interactive tools. I mean, um, many things are possible with um, with modern technologies. So I think technology really plays an important role in keeping these memories alive and um, as of now there are still um, contemporary uh, witnesses um, who talk about um, uh, what they have experienced during Holocaust and uh, there is uh, there are lots of initiatives going on to really preserve um, their memories. Um, this is one thing and then also I mean we have to uh, also look at the second or the third generation um, of uh, especially of, of Holocaust vi uh, victims who can of course talk from also a very personal perspective about their family um, history. Um, so this is also something that's that's being done at the moment and then of course uh, Holocaust education started right away, right after World War II. And um, so there is already a lot being preserved in our museums, in our archives, uh, in, in monuments that, um, that people can visit. So, um, and all the concentration camps actually have been turned into a memorial sites. So this is all still there. And uh, I know it cannot replace meeting an actual um, contemporary witness, but this is probably as close as we can get. And in terms of funding, how do these museums, the ones who are in charge of archives and everything, how do they get those finances to, to keep operating and keep getting new materials? In the sector, it's clearly public funding. And um, as I said, there is really a big momentum to um, to to keep Holocaust education on the uh, curricula, to um, optimize it, to improve it, to also adapt it to, to um, these challenges that we had uh, just discussed. Uh, and also, of course, there are private initiatives. There are also many private museums, for instance, of families uh, who have uh, been, been victims of the Nazi regime who want to preserve their family history. Um, so it's definitely a mix, but definitely um, there is a, a, a lot of uh, public funding available in Germany for um, preserving um, the memory and um, making the Holocaust and the, the Nazi regime um, not forget. It's very good that really the, the initiative is coming in terms of financing. The initiative is really coming from the government. Really something to learn from. Do you have some impact statistics? Somehow I, you mentioned something. Is it like one-fifth of the population do not know about the Holocaust? No, no. This was a study conducted in 2018 by the Kerber Foundation. And it was really about a Holocaust education and... Um, there was this number that everybody in Germany at that time was really shocked about. The number was that 40% of students between 
14 and 17 years of age, I think, um, were not aware what uh, the Auschwitz concentration camp was, or that Auschwitz was a concentration camp. And uh, I mean, of course, this is very shocking, but we also had to take a closer look uh, uh, at the statistics, because as I said before, um, the baseline is no German student leaves school without having talked uh, about the Holocaust, without having been educated about the Holocaust. Um, but starting from uh, grade eight, so um, some of those who were interviewed in the study um, probably were younger than uh, grade eight when they started interview uh, 14 year olds. Uh, so they have not been through this formal um, uh, part of their education yet, but still it's a concerning, it's an alarming number. And um, of course, I think we will talk about this later, but there is not only the role of the school, but also the role of the families, the role of the state. Um, so I think uh, Holocaust education is not, it's mainly, but it's not only about formal education at school. Mm -hmm. Very good. And um, what improvements are foreseen in the near future in terms of this initiative of the Holocaust education? Well, we have discussed uh, a couple of challenges already. So we, we really have this challenge of um, having less and less uh, contemporary witnesses. The mem memory gets more distant as we move ahead. I mean, that's, that's a natural thing. Um, so um, we do have to find a replacement for this direct contact and these direct conversations um, with uh, Holocaust survivors. And, and as I said before, this is quite challenging because also when I think back about my education, um, this was really the uh, um, conversation that left a lasting impression on me. And I remember many, many of my friends actually started crying because it was just so unbelievable what um, these persons, um, the Holocaust survivors that we met told us about um, their experience and their family's experience. Um, so this is something hard to replace. And as I said, we need to uh, move ahead with uh, technological solutions um, to this. And uh, of course, also finding other ways and just uh, providing a very holistic, um, uh, a holistic stance uh, towards Holocaust education. Um, then, uh, of course, we also um, talked about this before, that there is an increase of uh, rightist, of extremist tendencies in our societies, um, especially on social media and on the internet. Um, you can you can find misinformation, disinformation, anti-Semitic uh, rhetoric that needs to be countered. Um, and also here, um, there is of course a strategy how to deal with it. But as you can imagine, uh, uh, it's it's quite difficult and it's quite hard to really uh, um, deal with uh, all the single bits and pieces of of this and misinformation that are out there on the internet. And then lastly, uh, another challenge I would like to, to mention and to discuss is, um, and this is a positive development, of course, Germany is becoming more and more diverse uh, also in, in the student body. Um, this is due to migration into Germany and um, it's a real um, it's a real opportunity, of course, but it also poses challenges in terms of, um, for instance, Holocaust education, since you have a diverse classroom of uh, persons of many different uh, um, backgrounds, but also with different national identities. So not necessarily all the students in the classroom have this uh, um, uh, German identity and, and um, some of the students may have different um, different ways of having dealt with the, their own uh, pasts, but also with um, like Holocaust education in the past. So we really have to, um, of course, 
stick to the goal of um, making students understand what happened, who were the perpetrators, and of course, who were the victims and what happened to them. But we also have to open up the discussion and um, have an honest conversation about cultural and religious diversity, about tolerance, about nonviolence, about human rights, and about democracy. And I think this is the common denominator, and this is um, uh, one of the goals of Holocaust uh, education in Germany, to really give the students the knowledge, of course, but also empower them to think critically and to learn from the past and learn about what it means for a society to uh, have uh, experienced such a, um, a cruel um, past, such a, a genocide like uh, the Holocaust that happened. Yeah, you mentioned two things that I took note of. Really the challenge of fighting anti-Semitism because if the, I mean, recently the, the ones who didn't believe in the vaccine could put their information and the ones who believed in the vaccine could fight with their own information and then each one fighting their little little arguments and sometimes it's just the algorithm of facebook <laughs> who could be the winner in really pushing what what the others are are really interested to look at i mean the algorithm is also one key player i think in this effort to fight uh anti-semitism um yeah. So, and then the other challenge I, that is very interesting that you really have a diverse, limited, limiting it to the school population, a diverse, if I have a class of uh, half Germans and the rest are from all over the world, it really is quite challenging to engage the non-Germans to be interested in this. But I think there will come in the civic uh, responsibility. We're part, we're one world what happened to Germany, what happened to the Jews also affects me as a Filipino because we're one, we are, for me, we're on one race, one children of God. Really thinking that that is another challenge for teachers exactly. to bring up their, the children's civic responsibility or inclusiveness or diversity, right? So for me as an educator, I really like sympathize with the teachers who are in front of all of this diverse group and them teaching Holocaust education. The others could be bored about it, doesn't affect them, right? Yeah, yeah, it's really a challenge to, to teach it in a way that everybody, uh, you know, understands what this is about and how important this is and really learns uh, from it and can relate to it. But as you said, then um, we have to open this, this discussion up because in the end it's about values and uh, and human rights, right? Right. Now you mentioned values. Let's go to my other question for you as a parent. Yeah. So how useful is the Holocaust education in educating your children, in being courageous to face the truth, to accept the truth, not to deny it? I mean, I have to say that I'm really happy to know that I will send my uh, my children to a German school and that I can be sure they will have, um, uh, they will be educated about this period of German history. They will be equipped um, with the means and the skills to actually understand it and then also learn from it. And um, uh, so, so I think this is really something very important and this is something I can be, or I am personally uh, um, very happy about that I don't have to worry about this because it will be taken care of by the state uh, or by the school if, if you want. And um, as I said, I mean, it's about understanding what happened and who were the victims, but it's also about um, equipping my kids with um, the, um, the right or the, the skills to critical thinking, but of course the right to, um, to historical truth, to historical accuracy. And um, this is something that sounds maybe a bit trivial or, or people might wonder why would this be important, but I think it's really crucial if we want 
uh, our kids to, to be empowered as citizens living in a democratic society. Truth is actually crucial when it comes to justice um, to be delivered in a society. It is about inclusiveness, um, especially if you live in, in Germany with um, at the moment still with victims of the Nazi regime. Um, you cannot just not talk about it. You have to face the truth. And um, I see it as a basic right. And uh, I'm happy that uh, it is somehow being taken care of professionally with uh, a curriculum that is quite clear in, in um, its, its goals and objectives. So you would uh, somehow delegate to the school and would not really tackle Holocaust at an age younger than the eighth grade? Like what age is eighth grade? Eighth grade is probably like 15 years in Germany. But no, this is not what I wanted to say. I just wanted to say that I think in, in a way there is, um, it's, it's being taken care of. But I think the... Holocaust is so present in Germany that if my kids grow up in Germany, which they will, or at least they will spend a, a lot of time there, um, it will be a topic much, much earlier than uh, eighth grade. And then, of course, uh, the parents come in, in and uh, other institutions or the state also, um, because it's it's quite visible in Germany. We have all these memorials. If you just think about um, the Holocaust Memorial, which is close to the Brandenburg Gate uh, in Germany. It's huge. I think it's 4.5 acres in the heart of Berlin. So you can really not uh, miss it, basically. And I'm sure that my kids will ask me about what that is. Why are these stones there? What do they stand for? And um, of course, it's uh, we if we go there with our kids we have to tell them that it's actually not a playground and where where they can run around and and uh, you know uh, have uh, a lot of fun they can of course use the space but they should also be aware of of what it means and that there might be also persons uh, there who even have been victims of the Nazi regime. So it's also about respect uh, um, to the place. And then um, I don't know if you have heard about the stumbling blocks. We call it Stolpersteine in Germany. So in every German city, you would find these golden stones on the ground. Ah, yes. Um, yes, I've heard of that. Blocks and all these stones have a name on it of a victim of the Nazi regime and uh, some more information about it. And I'm sure that even if we go back to Berlin now, my kids will already see this and will ask what it, what it is or why it's golden or why, it, why it's there. And I think it's then in the responsibility of the parents to find a way, of course, to talk about the horrors without horrifying the kids. And to be honest, I still have a couple of <laughs> of months or maybe even years left before I, um, I um, have to, to take up this challenge and I will probably read a little bit about it before or inform, like get a, a sense of how to um, explain that to, to your kids. And um, I mean, these are just two examples of how we, um, of how we get in, in touch with our past and um, how, it, how present and visible it is. And um, also going to museums. There are great uh, exhibitions in Germany, especially focusing on kids. And as I said, not horrifying them, but still give them some of the basics uh, uh, in their understanding of what German history is about. So I think there are many ways and there is lots of material. So, so we would just have to uh, search on the internet and might get loads of inspiration and, and inputs of how to deal with that also already at a, a younger age and outside the school. Yeah, I can imagine the challenge for every parent. Are there other challenges in terms of truthfulness in the German society that you're preparing to, to form your kids in? Or is I mean, it really no. already the huge thing about truthfulness? 
No, I mean, of course, as you uh, just uh, um, in in the in your initial statement um, introduced, that there are lots of facets of uh, untruthfulness in our society since it starts like, you know, with minimal lies or just, you know, um, making your CV look nicer. Um, but of course, I think we shouldn't mix up uh, um, these uh, these two things. One is really about historical accuracy and truthfulness in our, uh, in our dealing with our history. And this is something that is not uh, to be compromised on. So, so this is something we have to be very clear and we have to be very steadfast in, um, you know, teaching nothing but the truth. Um, but then, of course, yeah, then there are other political challenges. Um, lots of misinformation going on on the internet. Uh, I mean, if we look at the uh, uh, Russian war in Ukraine, um, the sheer amounts of misinformation um, that can be found on the internet, it's actually very hard to, um, to deal with that. And it's very hard to counter this with facts and with the truth. Um, and uh, I mean, this is just one other example of, of many, many, especially political topics where we find lots of myths um, on, especially on the internet. And here, I think if we look at our kids and if we look at, our, at uh, education, I mean, we cannot um, hide this from our kids and our kids will eventually go on the internet and get in touch with this. So we should really equip our kids and our children with the skills um, to make a difference between misinformation and facts to uh, really give them the skills of critical thinking, of questioning what they are reading, of checking the sources, of double checking uh, the sources. Um, so um, I think there is just this, this sheer amount of um, misinformation on the internet that um, it's really about the, um, we really have to, to get to take a step back and really deal, empower our kids to deal with it. And um, we cannot, you know, counter every single uh, um, bit and piece of, of disinformation on the internet. Of course, this is one thing. And the other thing is really teaching about the values and the core values and give them, uh, give our kids um, this, this type of education that they really can can make a difference between what is wrong and what is right, what is human. Very good. Really is a challenge. Like we're not living in our grandparents' world. This is really different times. Very, very challenging, very difficult in terms of educating the younger generation and really all my prayers and support for all the parents out there. And thank you very much for distinguishing really the importance of, okay, I've mentioned other enhancement, other euphemisms, other ways to whitewash the truth, and but this is really huge, no? The historical accuracy. Thank you for that. And would you have other tips or strategies to propose about educating the children in in truthfulness? Yes, yes. Um, well, maybe just uh, um, the strategy that we have discussed in the beginning, that um, actually it's not only learning from textbooks and listening to the teacher, but it's exactly about going out of the classroom, experience um, different historical sites, visit monuments. And of course, I mean, the most valuable uh, thing here is to um, have these personal encounters with um, contemporary witnesses, with um, their families, with the second or third generation of, of victims of such horrors. Um, so I think this is really crucial. And then if a society is not ready yet, it's really about um, documenting, collecting the information. It's about archiving just to give future generations the possibility to deal with their future because it's just so important for their identity and it's actually a, I think, basic human right, uh, this right to, to information but to historical accuracy.
Well, thank you very much for your time, Laura. I really appreciate the effort, the time, the presence, and really the sharing of all your insights as a citizen, as a parent to this topic on truthfulness, especially using Germany's Holocaust education as a case study. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to talk to you. So I hope you learned a lot from Germany's Holocaust education and relating it to the topic of really fomenting, encouraging a lot of truthfulness in society. We can learn a lot from Germany in terms of fighting historical revisionism, which is a very contemporary topic in many areas of the world. So I hope you like this video and don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell so that you will know whenever I am uploading a new video. Bye for now.